All right, so let's uh, get started since it's 10 already. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, good morning and welcome to this uh, final presentation showcase for the summit program on directed research on COVID-19 uh, related challenges. Um, my name is Ivan Bermejo Moreno and I'm an assistant professor in the aerospace and mechanical engineering department. Together with uh, Professor K. Gupta, Professor Mitubuhar and Professor Anita Pinkova, we have co-organized this summit program on directed research and we have a fantastic group of uh, 10 students whose names you see listed um, on the screen who are going to present today on their uh, great work over the summer on four different projects. Um, here you see uh, an overview of these projects. Uh, there is one on disinfection robots, um, another one on personal protective equipment, the third one on uh, powered air purifying respirators, and the final one on droplet and aerosol dispersion modeling. As you can see, we organized the, the students in groups of two or three, and they had one uh, main faculty advisor, even though we uh, had group uh, meetings with all the participants and feedback was provided to all the participants uh, regularly. Now, before we get started, I wanted to introduce the different faculty members. The students are going to introduce themselves through the presentations. So um, let's get started with um, Professor S.K. Gupta. Uh, please, if you can uh, tell us a little bit about your, your work, that'll be fantastic. Sure, so I'm S.K. Gupta. I direct Center for Advanced Manufacturing. Our center does four main things. The first work is an additive. So we do a lot of work in additive related to metal fabrication, composite, micro-scale, multifunctional type of fabrication and additive. We also do a lot of work in robotics applied to manufacturing, and that's how we were, you know, uh, working on this particular project where we were looking at it, you know, how we can use the robots for uh, disinfection. We also do a lot of work in smart manufacturing where we put sensors on the machines, collect data, do machine learning, data analytics, and we also do work in digital manufacturing, which is related to use of augmented reality and virtual reality applied to manufacturing. So that kind of summarizes, you know, basically what we do at the Center for Advanced Manufacturing. And I let the student present what they have done this summer. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta. So next, uh, let's have uh, Professor Mitul Luhar introduce himself. Wonderful. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, hi, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mitul Luhar. I'm an assistant professor in aerospace and mechanical engineering. So I run the Fluid Structure Interactions Lab in the AME department, and um, the kinds of things that we do are shown on the right here. Uh, we uh, do lots of experimental testing and modeling for passive control of turbulent flows. So we design and optimize shark skin inspired riblets, uh, and increasingly we're using additive manufacturing to 3D print uh, design our porous materials for both flow control and heat transfer. We also do some bio-inspired robotics work. So we're developing some soft robots inspired by sea stars uh, for Navy applications. And we do, we do some sort of fundamental turbulence modeling as well. Um, for the, the COVID-19 um, challenges, um, uh, my students and I have been and we're working on developing a very simple room scale model that could be used to inform uh, occupant density and HVAC requirements and things like that. Um, and so if anybody's interested, please feel free to reach out to me. My coordinates are shown on the top left. Uh, but really today is about the students. So let me, um, let me stop there and uh, we can pass along to the next faculty advisor. Thank you very much, Professor Luhar. And now let's uh, continue with Professor Anita Penkova. Please, if you can introduce yourself. Good morning. My name is Anita Penkova, and my lab is focused on biotransport processes and predictive mathematical models for intravitreal drug delivery, which is the current state of treatment for age-related macular degenerations. And this is one of the diffusion models that we have. Uh, my project starts from predictive mathematical models for ocular phenomena to acoustic levitation for retinal organoids. And lately, we we'll focus also on a COVID engineering solutions like this paper shown here, but 
The focus now is also on another paper that we designed with uh, Bonian Ren and Frank Zhang. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Penkova. And uh, just to give you a couple of words about my research, I work on the Computational Aerospace Laboratory and uh, we focus mainly on turbulent flow simulations with some other complex physics, for example, flow structure interaction, shock waves, combustion, and so on. And we include uh, high fidelity numerical simulations as well as numerical diagnostics. We develop our own software and we try to uh, deploy it on the supercomputers across the national labs here in the United States to run these simulations. So let's move on now to the students who are the, the really the protagonists of this uh, event. The, progr the program goals that we had was to mainly identify challenges that are related to this COVID-19 pa pandemic that we are living in and to identify the impact that uh, this type of engineering research uh, can have to propose and develop uh, potential solutions within the time span that we had for the program, which was about two and a half months. And then another important component of this program was to conduct uh, collaborative remote research. So we had, uh, we provided the students with access to a number of tools that you see here listed on the bottom right uh, for them to enable these uh, collaborations. So without further ado, let's begin with the, with the first group uh, on disinfection robots. So I think, uh, Jerry, you're going to uh, share the screen. So if you can please go ahead, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And, uh, and just a before... reminder, while Jerry's yeah. setting up, please feel free to ask any questions uh, using the chat feature during the presentation. Um, and after the presentation, you can also ask uh, by unmuting yourselves. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Luhar. I completely forgot about mentioning that. So uh, let's get started with uh, the first group on disinfecting robots. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, this is Disinfection Robot Functional Modification Group for 2020 Summer Directed Research, um, addressing engineering solution to COVID-19 crisis. Our project was led and directed by Professor S.K. Gupta. Our group members are me, Jerry, Nimish, and Xi Yue. We'll first address why and what we were trying to deal with during our summer directed research. As we all know, our global society was struck with COVID-19 pandemic earlier this year. In order for economy to keep on going, we eventually had to open up our city. In order to do this in a controlled manner, some sort of cleansing, rather disinfection of COVID virus is necessary. It is too much of a risk and energy consumption for human task force to do all of this. As a result, disinfection robot robotics has risen to be a solution. Currently, numerous types of disinfection robots exist in the current market. Mainly, they are divided into three categories of ultraviolet light, chemical, and combination of both methods. This is Xenex. It uses flash of UV lights to zap the bacteria in hospital areas. This is USC's Adams UV from Cam Center, which uses a UV wand to disinfect office areas such as desks or keyboards. This is Nanyang Technological University's XDBot, which uses chemical disinfection technique to cleanse the public areas. We have specified our objective in the beginning of the projects as follows, effectiveness, speed, and assurance. In order to make improvements on efficiency of the disinfection robot, we have decided to implement combination of UV light and chemical spray onto our system. This was addressed by spray mechanism design. We have set our second objective to improve the disinfection rate of our system. This was addressed by motion planning. Lastly, we have set third objective as assurance to ensure that the targeted areas were disinfected with efficient coverage of spray. This was addressed by spray areas detection. Next, Nimish will explain about hardware and mechanical systems. 
Thank you, Jerry. Next slide, please. Here we can see this is Adams equipped with chemical spray mechanism mounted on it. Part of a system can be mounted is as seen mounted at the end defector. Next slide. These are the both hardware and software components of the system. In hardware components, currently RealSense camera is used for spray droplet detection, UFI used for executing the motion, pump system for dispensing the disinfectant, and mobile base for manipulating the atoms. In software modules, we have motor control for controlling the pump system and path planner for generating the required trajectory for disinfecting the selected surfaces. I will be going over uh, in the detail of the path planning algorithm and code in the next few slides. Next. Currently, Adams and pumping system are two independent systems. The mobile base and URF are controlled by ROS based architecture. The pump is controlled by Arduino via DC relay. In future, we are planning to integrate the control of pump system with ROS. Next. So, the operator has control over the atoms where he or she wants to deploy it. In the current system, once the robot reaches at desired location, operator inputs the bounding region of the surface to be disinfected. Based upon these bounding regions, the waypoints are calculated for the motion path. The path is generated such that the overlapping of spray pattern is optimum, thereby minimizing the quantity of required fluid. Next, Jerry would be explaining the mechanical aspect of our project. In order to mount our spray system onto Adam's UR5 arm, we needed a mechanical medium to do so. As a result, we have designed a holder that mounts both the camera and the spray system. We have designed in the simplistic manner with down-to-earth dimension measurement and fixture to SOLIDWORKS CAD program. This is the breakdown of the spray system we have developed. We have simply configured Arduino and power supply to turn on the DC water pump to move the up of the disinfection liquid to the end of the tube in which liquid will be released through a nozzle. In order for the spray system to pr produce a fine mist, a correct nozzle has to be found. Both online and offline market research were conducted to find the best matching nozzle. This is the nozzle spray characterization we have considered when we were making a selection of the nozzle in order to improve. Our nozzle was selected to have full cone spray pattern with spray angle between 60 to 65 degrees wide and coverage of 30 square centimeters. The flow rate was projected to be from 50 to 80 milliliters per minute in which was tested for a calculated value which will be shown in the results. Next, Xi Wei will explain about the spray detection. Thank you, Jerry. Next, please. For spray detection task, we first focus on the specific disinfection object, a box, which will be shown in the video. The mist from liquid surface in the surface of the box the region cannot be well detected by finding difference between before disinfection and after disinfection images. So we detect spray areas of the inner surface of the box and other objects in different ways. For the inner surface of the box, since the background is simple, we can use histogram equalization to increase the contrast of the image after disinfection in order to get the large sprayed regions. Then we compute gradient images to show spray details. At last, we combine the results and get the final result. For other objects, we can take before and after images from the same angle. Then we find the difference between before and after image for spray regions detection. Then we compute the gradient images and find the difference between them for detailed detection and compile the results. Next. And this is the gradient computation operator selection. As you can see, robots and pre-width cannot detect the gradient change clearly. Next. Sobo and Shar have better results than the others. So in my code, I use Shar operator for gradient computation. Next. These are some results of the inner surface spray areas detection. 
The green means that these errors are detected to have been sprayed, and the red errors have not been sprayed. Next. Then I will show you the results of different objects. This is a knob. I compare the results of the raw images and the gradient images. As you can see, the wall is uneven, and the gradient images is very sensitive to these small disturbances. Even if I use the difference between before and after gradient images, the result will still show more useless details than we want. Next. In the result of gradient images, it is sensitive to the texture of the wall. It is good at detecting the edge instead of the region. In the left image, the result shows green region, but in the right image, it only shows green edge. In conclusion, finding the difference between raw images has good region detection, and it is robust to complex background. It won't be disturbed by some useless details. The differences between the gradient images has good detail detection on the simple background, but it is very sensitive to the disturbance of complex background. Next. These are the results of some other objects. As you can see, it detects the spray regions very well. Next, these are the results of tub and trash can, which, can also, uh, which, which are also very common in our daily life. Then, Nimish will show us the video of the whole system. This is Jerry working on the hardware setup. Once Adam reaches the desired location, as we can see here, the operator generates a trajectory and executes the motion. Here we can see the arm is performing the previously generated S motion. We can see in the results that the inner surfaces are efficiently covered without excessive usage of the disinfectant. This is Shiva working on the image processing of the results. And as we can previously, as, as we can see, it was previously explained, the green denotes the detected region. These are a few common objects for which atoms could be deployed for disinfection purpose. Next slide. These are some of the key results of the disinfection process. The required disinfectant was about 40 milliliter and the thickness of coating was roughly around 50 microns. Also, the user has control over the coating thickness, which here he can vary by changing the speed of the operation. Next. So our system can eff efficiently coat the surfaces with user-defined speed and coating thickness with minimal usage of disinfectant. Also with image detection, spray coated areas can be visualized for coverage assurance. Next. These are some proposed future plans. Currently, the arm is equipped with only single end defector, hence developing a multi-tool end defector for enabling manipulability of the objects is essential. Also, for the effective disinfecting disinfection and imparting multimodal disinfection capability, UV light and spray mode needs to be integrated. And at the last, considering the reach of the current UR5 arm, the system needs to be scaled for disinfecting larger objects. Next. These are our references. And thank you for listening to our presentation. We would be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, Nimish, and CUA for a great uh, presentation in this work. And now, any questions from the audience? And just as a reminder, you can unmute your microphone. You can also post the question on the chat if you prefer. Uh, so any questions? Lockheed Martin. And my question for the group is, what are your plans, I guess, moving forward? Are you 
planning on continuing this or expanding upon it, that kind of thing? Um, in terms of in terms of continuation, um, in in uh, USC uh, robotics lab and various uh, research group, uh, there are uh, extension of this idea of disinfection robotics, and I believe uh, S Professor S K Gupta and other faculty members have already distributed uh, continuation pathways for uh, this this similar type of project, and students are being uh, collected uh, in order to participate, and I I. Uh, we believe that that is the uh, continuation of um, disinfection robotics, uh, similar to our projects. Uh, hi, Carly, this is SK. Yeah, so work will continue. We'll have a new group of students who will start working. Okay, great, thank you. And we do have a question on the, on the chat by Mike Kopak. The question is, any consideration to viewing spraying at different angles? It seems like all the detection and spraying was being done 100% perpendicular to the front surface and most of the detection was also therefore directly in front. In explanation, you were not detecting much along the sides in the box test, for example. So do you have any comments on, on that? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, we would like, it, is, it was planned to improve the algorithm such that the end effector would be always normal to the surface of the spray box, but that's in our like little bit of future plans, like there are a few upgrades that are needed to be done. So, yeah, we, we do know about this problem, but thank you for addressing. Okay, so Mike, this is SK again. Uh, yes, so, uh, you know, we do have the planning capability where we can plan path and we can actually look at things at an angle. It's just that in this case, they didn't get around to experiment with those, uh, you know, path where we can spray at an angle and also image at an angle. Because right now, the camera and the nozzle are basically, you know, basically parallel, their axes are parallel to each other. And they're since in the same robot arm. So since they did all their spray basically from a perpendicular angle, therefore they image it also from perpendicular angle. But now the system already has capability of uh, generating path at an angle, and once that is tried on the physical robot, then that should happen as well. All right, thank you very much, uh, Carly and Mike, for your questions. Any further questions or comments? And, and uh, Ivan, can I just make one more comment there? Please go ahead. Yeah, so they, so, you know, so Nimesh Jerry and Shive just presented basically our new chemical spray disinfection mode. Uh, in past, another team of students had already worked out on the UV uh, disinfection mode. So they didn't cover that work, but we have that capability as well, where we can disinfect using UV wand. Excellent. Thank you very much. So big round of, of applause for the, for the group, uh, Jerry Nimish and Shi Yue for your excellent work. And uh, now let's move on to the next group and uh, that's going to be on personal protective uh, equipment handling. So Marisa, Sam and John, uh, please, if you can share your screen and uh, get started. Thank you, Professor Medemehuan. Um, I'm just gonna share it here. Um... Excellent. So I think we can see the screen. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is John Michael Mitchell, and I'm here with Wing Sum Lai and Mercer and Tria. We're all master's students in the aerospace and mechanical engineering department here at USC. Today, we would like to present our findings from our summer director research under Dr. Matul Luhar on recommendations for COVID-19 PPE. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, our current situation is very simply the prevalence of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lack of a vaccine have made PPE an important part of daily life. There's a lot of information out there, either officially or unofficially published, which consequently misinforms the public. So 
the latter and the following points have inspired her work. Um, the use of masks is ubiquitous as masks are known to be highly effective. Um, two recommendations on face masks vary across local, state, and international mandates. Uh, an increased PPE waste, increased PPE waste is due to largely increased use of disposable masks. And uh, for an unknown fate, the unknown fate of potentially infected PPE in public non-biohazard waste bins hasn't entirely been considered. Um, so our team's objectives, uh, the current state of our mass supply is compiled by their disposable mass made of polypropylene or customized homemade mass. And while it could very well vary for homemade mass, disposable masks are one, heat sensitive, and two, not designed to withstand an intensive sterilization process. So the point of our project is to provide general guidelines on primarily mask, material selection, design, disinfection, and disposal. Um, so the coronavirus has an enveloped spherical shape, one one hundredth the size of the thickness of human hair, about 65 to 125 nanometers. Uh, its structure consists of glycoproteins or spikes, uh, an envelope, capsid, and RNA. It's vulnerable to increased temperature and increased solar radiation, solar uh, and um, solar exposure and UV radiation. Um, it, uh, which we, we we will touch on in uh, a little bit in the presentation. Um, okay, right here's the stability analysis of COVID-19 in different surface and temperature. The paper and tissue paper have the shortest fiber straightforward time of 30 minutes, and the fibers can stay on copper surface for 15 hours. We will further explain it on the later session. For face masks and other materials, the fibers can be last for a few days. Moreover, we found that the increased temperature can effectively decrease the fibers survival time. This is the CDC guideline for surgical face masks and cough face masks. The surgical masks need to fulfill several requirements regarding filtration, biocompatible components, flammability, and fluid resistance. And the surgical masks are not recommended to clean and reuse. For the cough mask, it is recommended to be made of cotton and have a proper elasticity for strips. It's recommended to clean and reuse. We can wash it by hand or machine. Also, heat dry and air dry are recommended. For the relevant work at USC, the first one is the customized mask frame by Professor Chang. It's a 3D print mask frame providing conformance to personal face shape, better suiting ability, and more comfort. And the second one is the UVC disinfection system by Professor Armani. It's a designed, construct, and related UVC disinfection system made from accessible materials, which are plastic beam, UVC light bulb, and light housing. Moreover, Cat Medicine of USC has set up a web page providing the public some information and guidance regarding some 3D print PPEs, such as reusable face masks, face shields, and ear savers. The most important quality for selecting a mask is the fit. The table on the right shows the filtration efficiencies of different fabrics for the size of the coronavirus particle. Avoiding gaps, which is defined in the table as 1% of the mask surface area between the mask and your face is critical, as most material experience drops in filtration efficiencies of around 60%. Furthermore, hybrid and multi-layer materials are best for masks due, due, due to the addition of electrostatic filtration, which is caused by the two fibers running together. Our recommendation for a mask material is a cotton silk hybrid due to its high filtration efficiency and being 100% biodegradable. Other options include cotton quilt, which, is, which isn't 100% biodegradable, as well as multi-layer high thread count cotton if other options are unobtained. Uh, next, please. Again, fit is the defining feature in mask selection. We recommend looking for masks that have adjustable straps, which allow for easier conformance to the face shape, 
rigid frames, which while uncomfortable, create an effective seal around the face. And additionally, the nose trip, which is commonly found in N95 respirators and is great at preventing air escape around the nose. Here at USC, Professor Yong Chen has created one of the most effective mask sealing technologies using a face scan app and a 3D printer. However, these technologies might not be accessible to everyone, so our recommendations are, mo are more common alternatives. Keck Medicine at USC also has a 3D, 3D print files available for reusable filtered masks, ear savers, and face shields, which can be found on their website. So these are various disinfection methods that are known to be effective uh, by vapor, hydrogen peroxide, VHP, ozone gas, UVC, and uh, dry heat. Each has its, its, its advantages as well as its disadvantages. Perhaps the biggest shared disadvantage, however, across all of these methods is that they've only been experimentally tested and potentially verified on N95 respirators only, not applicable surgical masks or homemade masks. So again, this is the UVC disinfection box presented by Professor Amani and her team at USC. Uh, it's built using common material and its efficacy is valid validated using Bacillus cereus, which is a, a bacteria as a test organism. Uh, although it's not the coronavirus specifically, it is used to to test the, the harshness of UV conditions, which it can withstand. Uh, it is effective, but small volume, it's small in volume and it's not scalable and using UVC lamps, it, it is potentially dangerous. We created an alternative to the UVC box that only uses natural sunlight to disinfect PPE. Pictured here is an example of a nine by nine by six inch solar concentration disinfection box. Some advantages include its simple design, which allows for easy construction at home, as well as the design being scalable in its dimensions. You could make a small box for use on small PPE such as a mask, or you can make a large box to fit an entire set of clothing. Additionally, it is safer and cheaper than UVC light products. However, we still recommend using a UVC box for smaller products such as masks due to their faster disinfection time and lack of dependence on sunlight availability. Next. Uh, this was our bill of materials for our box. All materials are easily obtained through common providers like Amazon or McMaster Car. All you need is the box, mirror sheets, the top mirror positioning arm, cotton tape for the bottom of the box, which we chose for its low virus inactivation time and reflective properties, as well as duct tape to put it all together. Next. In order to create our box, First, you have to remove three of the four flaps from your box. Next, using one of the removed flaps, tape it to the underside of the remaining flap in a T-shape, highlighted in yellow. This will be used to support the positioning arm later. Next, line the bottom of the box with the copper tape and then line each side of the box with the mirror sheets. Next, then tape the positioning arm on top of the remaining box flap. Finally, grab one of the other removed box flaps, apply a mirror sheet to one side and tape it to the positioning arm. That will allow you to angle the position your arm to better suit the, where the sun is in the sky. And that's it. Next. Um, so this is a table detailing the maximum solar exposure at the indicated um, season under ideal conditions, which means no clouds, no haze, air pollution or shadows to reduce exposure. And it's independent of site evaluation or the metropolitan metropolitan area indicated on the table. Um, the maximum daily solar UVB fluence values for the selected locations at specific times of the year are based on predicted influenza inactivation by solar UVB. 35% of the total daily fluence was divided by 120 minutes to yield the noontime UVB flux in joules per uh, meter squared, values of which are highlighted in aqua blue. In yellow, you'll see the time in minutes it takes to reduce 90% infectivity. So for example, Los Angeles, our location during our time in the summer, 18 minutes and, it, and with a safety factor of two, uh, just for safety purposes, um, would be the recommended time to inactivate uh, potentially the coronavirus. For the potential health and safety issue of PPE disposal, the untreated waste with 
potential fibers could infect the sanitation workers in the public waste stream and then spread beyond to the entire community. Next. The recommendation on disposal will be defined in two parts. The first one is the personal disposal. This addresses our earlier disinfection for use the mask to prevent possible virus growth and spreading. We can disinfect this use, uh, using our solar condensation box or other disinfectants such as soap, chlorine, and various heat treatments. And the second part is the city scale solution. We recommend a disposal procedure with segregation in specialized self disinfection trash bin. Once the face mask is ready to be thrown, it should be segregated and disinfected in a specialized trash bin, and the bin should be marked with the universal flower as a symbol for easy identification. Then the waste should be treated with incineration or steam sterilization as per EPA guidelines. Finally, the treat waste can be disposed to landfill for natural composting. And you guys can see the picture on the right. The similar idea had been adopted in the Shenzhen, China. Next, please. To conclude, proper fit is the most important feature when selecting a mask. Masks should be made of a hybrid or multi-layered material, ideally a cotton silk hybrid, but Others such as cotton silk or cotton or cotton high thread count cotton and cotton quilt are also options. Our solar disinfection box is customizable and scalable alternative to UVC boxes. And in Los Angeles, the recommended disinfection times are about 36 minutes in the summer and as much as four and a half hours during the winter. Some caveats with all our research include that the research was done by us, college students, and was not experimentally verified. Furthermore, some challenges our team faced include the difficulty of maintaining performance quality without sacrificing biodegradability. Additionally, our solar disinfection box disinfection time is longer than most known disinfection methods. Thanks for coming to our presentation. If anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to share. We also have a prototype professor that we built, so that's why I had to stop the presentation. Nice. Yeah, built it. <laughs> Um, yeah, just using the assembly method, the assembly instructions that we wrote up and the uh, materials that we put in our bill of materials. Let's see. Constructed. <laughs> um, Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, John, Marisa, and Sam, for a great presentation and a great set of recommendations for all of us and the world. So now, if we have any questions from the audience, please go ahead. You can also type them on the chat if you prefer. So I have one question. Uh, so basically the disinfection time, is it based upon 90%? Uh, you know, you know, killing of bacteria or, or virus or is it based upon higher percent? Uh, it's based on 90%. Okay. Mm -hmm. You may want to note that very prominently because most of the places 90% won't cut it. Mm -hmm. People want 99.9 percent. .9%. Oh, okay. If your things are 90 percent, then you really want to note it because you know 90 percent is not going to be considered safe enough for most applications, right? Oh, okay, okay. The uh, uh, the, uh, the time we recommended, it, we applied a safety factor of two, so for half that time is 90 percent, and then we doubled the time from there. So it should be in theory more than 90 percent, but okay. The original time was 90%. Okay. Just to, you know, kind of note so that people can, and of course, if somehow you can estimate that this double, does it get to 99.9 .9 or does it get to 95%? Does it get to 99? I mean, it will be good to kind of, or this is unknown and therefore need to be figured it out in future, right? Whichever way it is, I think it's good to note that, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a, I have a question. Um, just as an inherently lazy person, how does it compare just, you know, taking your cloth masks and, and washing it in the laundry compared to UV exposure? <laughs> that's a good, that's a good question. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just thinking. <laughs> um, it's true, I, I did, uh, we did consider those 
those uh, alternatives um, with the uh, because the CDC already recommends washing your mask in the in the um, in the laundry machine. I forgot what you call it. The washing machine. Um, and um, I guess this is just a. Uh, this was made to be like a, I guess, a more sustainable solution where I guess you wouldn't have to use water or power to plug it in. Um, that that was really the main point of the project was the sustainability factor, which a lot of cleaning methods and uh, like disinfection methods or whatever the case, it's always a, an elect, like, an electrically powered solution or you use water to disinfect. Um, well, I guess that also, yes, Professor. So also the other thing to note in, in answering Professor Kloshinsky's uh, question is, is did you find any data on tests on how much, you know, going through one washing cycle does in terms of viral uh, activity or infectivity? Uh, there weren't any, um, there weren't any uh, peer-reviewed articles on the efficacy of just washing your mask. In fact, is it was... Is anybody not, I guess I'm just polling the audience. Is anybody surprised that there's, that's not easy data to find? I, I actually believe you very much, I, I, but I also find it very surprising that nobody has published an article, a like, compelling article on something like this. Yeah, it's actually really surprising that in our search, in our like researching escapades, we never found any sort of data that said anything about like the like validating that method of, of cleaning, which is essentially how a lot of people wash their masks either by hand or just throwing it in the washing machine. Um, so, so one more real impact of your work is a lot of masks which are, you know, basically uh, one-time use and those masks you're going to wash, wash them, right? And large number of people on their own are beginning to do the similar thing which you are doing, right? Because these disposable masks, people want to reuse them again, right? Mm -hmm. and they cannot wash them. Washing is not an option. That will destroy the mask, right? Mm -hmm. So what they need to do is that they need to figure it out how to disinfect them without washing them. And therefore, you can use them again. Mm -hmm. So you are contributing to another very useful, you know, uh, you know thing where people can then uh, reuse the mask, right? I mean, even the one which were classified as purely disposable, you are creating another avenue for extending their use, basically. Yeah. Also, uh, the washing machine you expose your mask to your other potentially that. Uh, products that never uh, got in contact with COVID-19. So you also limit the exposure of the virus into your house and into all your other clothes and stuff. Even though it goes through the wash, like that's not going to necessarily get rid of everything. And so you wouldn't want to like take that into your house, take it through, put it up with your laundry and stuff like that. There is also a question in the chat. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Mike. Copac, which is, uh, do you need to move the objects around in the box to ensure that all surfaces get properly treated? Uh, or is there the risk of shadows obstructions causing some areas not getting exposure? Uh, I would say that the primary thing you need to do, which we forgot to mention, was flip your mask would be helpful, like affect each side for the required time. Uh, because even though obviously the outside of the mask, which is what faces everybody else, is like the primary source of where you get COVID-19 onto your mask, you can also get it on the interior of your mask. So ideally you would have to flip it as well, but there shouldn't be too much risk of shadow slash obstructions because one of the benefits of the mirror on the top is that say you have the sun facing directly at the top position mirror, it will reflect off that mirror into the back panel and then back onto the mask. So the back wall, I guess, which would normally create the shadow, since it's getting like a double hit from the mirror, will get sunlight that way. So in theory, it should have no shadows or obstructions that cause some areas not to get exposure. However, Anything that's facing like the, the bottom of the box would probably need to be flipped over just to be safe. Thank you. All right, then we have one more follow-up comment from uh, Mike Kopak. 
that says, but if you were to put multiple items in the box, uh, wouldn't those cause obstructions? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you were to stack the items on top of each other, they'd absolutely cause obstructions. That's one of the benefits of the fact that you can use our design and make like, get a larger box. So if you want, like, say you had a, like two or three t-shirts you wanted to do, you could do this kind of thing with a, a much larger box and try to lay out your t-shirts so they're not overlapping, ideally. But if, if they're overlapping, then I would recommend just, you know, making sure any area that gets overlapped that you can't cover, you would... Uh, after giving it the required infection time, you would flip your object around so that the areas that were covered were no longer exposed and do it again. So, like, for instance, like a shirt, like you mentioned, uh, you could like fold it in half and then like get one half, get the other half, then fold it in half the other way if you need to fit multiple shirts in there and then do it four times per side or whatever you need if your box is too small. But with our design, you could make a bigger box if you were intending to disinfect a large quantity of, of clothes in one sitting. Or make multiple boxes. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marisa, Sam, and John, for the great work and presentation. So another big round of applause for, for you. And now let's move on to uh, the group on PAPRs, Power Air Purifying uh, Respirators. So that's going to be uh, Bonian and Wang Zhu. So please, if you can share your screen. Excellent. So we can see it. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. This is our final presentation on the summer directive research. Our topic is paper design and repurposing. Our instructor is Dr. Anita Pankova. My name is Fan Zhou Zhang, and my teammate is. Uh, my name is Wanan Ren. We're both from Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering Department of USC Waterbury School. So, uh, this is our outline. We will give out motivations and background information in the first section, followed up is the literature review. And then we introduce our group's approach and our design. Uh, future work will be concluded in the last section. Currently, we're in a pandemic caused by the COVID-19 virus. We're facing a low supply of personal protective equipment, which is shortened as PPE, but high demand of PPE. According to a survey of the national mayors, 91.5% of the cities fill up the survey do not have an adequate supply of face masks for their first responders. 88.2 percentage of the cities fill out the survey do not have adequate supply of PPE items. To fill, out the gap, to fill the gap between the supply and demand, we need 24.4 billion PPE items. Next, please. We believe that after the pandemic is passed, the huge surge in manufacturing of pepper will cause a certain number of pepper does not have purpose to serve. Our solution to that is that we want to design and repurposing our power air purifying respirator, which is shortened as PAPR, pepper. We want to make our pepper design to be versatile so that they can serve in many situations. Right now we are thinking about snorkeling, firefighting, and machining. So at the beginning of our research, we looked into different types of peppers. Mainly we have full or partial face piece type, helmet type, and hood type. In addition, I further divided them into one unit style and separate unit style. The main difference here is the position on the filter unit and the fan unit. To achieve our purpose, a one into face mask is preferred. Two models were selected for detailed comparison in our presentation. One on the left is the one unit style pepper called ultra powered air perforating respirator from Clean Space Company. The right hand side, we have a separate unit style pepper called belt mounted pepper painter's kit from 3M Company. There are several important advantages in these designs, but these advantages, these advantages are also critical to consider. In addition, design standards were also reviewed to find the similarities that we can take and combine to our design. Mainly, three standards were found and studied. The first one is called CDC 42 CFR Part 84. In here, we have learned the required airflow rate for different applications. The second one is called ANSI ISEA Z87 2010 version. It is the standard that includes the design of mask in machine shop and the surface diving activities. This standard gives us some specific testing procedures that the mask must go over. A firefighter's helmet design standard NFPA 1986 was also studied. However, 6.1.10 section from this standard says that all SCBA shall have a voice communication capability that shall consist 
of a non-electronic transmission system. This statement does not fit into our design in two ways. First, we are not proposing a SCBA, which stands for self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, PEPPER is different than a SCBA in definition from the first standard. Also, if we want to include a surface diving feature in our design, the mask must be fully sealed. A non-electronic transmission system will need an opening on the mask. Here's the design considerations and limitations. We have uh, desired features and undesired features listed out after brainstorming. We would like the mask to have a uh, 115 liters per minute airflow. We want it to have a complete seal. It has a versatile filter choice. It must be easy and comfortable to wear. It has a long lasting battery, alarm system for battery and filter systems. It must be easy to dis disinfect and withstand nature. We don't want the mask to be restricting the, your movement of your head. We don't, want to, we don't want it to be heavy and bulky. We don't want it to have a narrow view range, break easily, scratch easily, and to be expensive. So from there, we have our design for the pepper mask. The mask consists of two main parts, which are the transparent cover in the front and the rubber ring that touch the user's face. The rubber ring was created based on the outline of a human head model which provides perfect seal. A flange is created inside the ring to fit different face shapes. The transparent cover has five bases created along its neck for pin connections with the belt. Two bayonet connections were created on each side of the mask for add-on components assembly. This picture shows how the design will look like when, uh, when it is put on. These are detailed pictures of the connector and the belt. The way we attach the two belts together is by pushing the three knobs at the tip of each belt into the hole correspondingly. A picture of how to wear this mask is shown here. We simply attach number one and two first, then we secure number three and four. The longest belt, number five, will go over the user's head and hold the four belts in place. So this is an enlarged picture for the bat uh, battery housing. The right picture is a lid, which will be snapped into the opening in front side on the left picture. The hole beneath it is the opening for wire for battery. The rectangular shape on the side is the holder for the alarm. In terms of connection between the belt and the bottom housing, several knobs will be corrected at the bottom of the housing, and it, it can be pushed into the same holes on the belt, which is used for belt connection showing the previous slide. So this picture shows how it will look like for this add-on component. Uh, shown here are pictures of our components used for ventilation systems. First two pictures shows our design for of an adapter. Uh, on one side of the of the adapter adapter, it has a bayonet connector to fit on the mask. On the other side is a cup shaped connector. To connect the fan housing to this connector, we will slide the teeth on the bottom of the housing to the opening inside the adapter. To secure the housing and create airtight seal between the two rubber material will be used. On the bottom, uh, the two components are filter housings. As shown in the picture, building connection is heavily used in these connectors. Inside the filter housing, we would like to uh, place a filter monitor from online. The filter will place on top of the filter housing. Following pictures uh, will show how to put on the add-ons. First, we have the mask ready. Then we will put on those two adapters for bayonet connections. And then the top parts are put on correspondingly. While relying on the airtight seal created by the rubber components, air inside the mask will be drawn by the fan when activated. Since the air flow out of the mask must be equal to the air flows in, ambient air will be sucked in through the filter, which will be complete, which this will complete our ventilation system and fulfill basic paper function. In terms of multifunctioning for snorkeling, we need to dismount all the other components and switch these two on. The left one is a stopper and the right one is the air tube. As the same as the other components shown in the last slide, rubber ring groove is created on the bottom for improved sealing. Here is how it will look like when you put everything on. Uh, we believe that when diving, you're at distance from the crowds, so a simple filter inside the tube or without a filter will be enough. This slide shows our electrical circuit for battery monitoring. On the left side, we have the nickel metal hybrid rechargeable battery. A 12 volt fan is then connected to the battery. 
The fan we choose has a 59 cubic feet per minute airflow rate. 115 liter per minute flow rate required from sender translate to only 4.06 CFM, so which means our fan will meet the requirements with no problem. A PC level battery tester is also included in the circuit. In principle, the tester could be programmed for testing a range of voltage from the battery. When certain level is reached, it will make a high volume alarm to warn the user for recharged battery. The digital display shows how much voltage is still inside the battery. It is also essential to have a monitoring system for the filter, keeping the user on track of how the condition of the filter. There's mainly two main ways to determine the filter condition. The first one is using a pressure sensor, collecting the pressure difference data before the air gone through the filter and after. The second way is to using a flow rate sensor. So we want to propose an experiment to measure the pressure drop across various parts of materials. The equipments for the experiment are, the first is a digital manometer, reading the pressure difference. The second one is the airflow rate sensor. We want to keep the airflow rate meet the requirement during the whole time. And then it's the stainless steel static tubes. And then it's the um, different filters and face masks. And then it's the air filter, airflow rate control mechanism. Move on to the handheld particle counter 3016-1IAQ. It is used for determining the size of the particle which will be blown to the filter. Lastly is the fan. We want to create two situations for the filter. The first one is called the clock filter situation. We want to place 20 grams of dust 10 centimeters before the filter so that give them distance to travel, make them move around more freely so that they can spread evenly in the air. Second is the damage filter situation. We want to cut the filter with sharp objects or even stretch them. After both scenario is prepared, we want to collect the pressure difference data for both of them and to see how the filter react. Download is an image of a simple schematic of how the experiment will look like. Move on to the material selection for our face max. There are three material candidates we considered. The first one is polycarbonate, the second one is acetate, and lastly, the PETG. Polycarbonate is a high performance material with incredible strength and durability. Being 200 times stronger than glass, polycarbonate is virtually unbreakable and also have, has having a very high impact strength. It is the ideal choice of clear plastic for many environments. It's mainly used for security screens, both strings and factory machine guards. Acetate provides the best clarity among all the materials and tends to be more scratch resistant. It also offers chemical splash protection and may be rated for impact protection. Lastly, the PUTG is easier to mold plastic with 70% of the impact strength of polycarbonate, but it's still, uh, still quite strong when comparing with glass. Although polycarbonate does not have the best clarity and best scratch resistance among the material candidates, but we believe that there are certain chemical treatment to the face mask we can do to improve that. So our final decision for our face mask material is part of the company. For elastic material selections, we choose neoprene. It has, it has the lowest possible shore hardness and provides the best mechanical protection among all the material candidates. It is commonly used for wetsuit manufacturing and can be sanitized by isopropanol alcohol easily. The price of this material is $1.89 to $2.69 per kilogram, according to the website. To validate our design, three tests from standard Z87-2010 were done in SolidWorks to 2019 as nonlinear dynamic simulations. The first simulation is dropout test. A 68-gram steel ball is dropped from a 1.27 meter away from the mask, which is completely fixed on the ground. The result shows that the maximum volumesis stress is 60.48 megapascals at the contact point. From calculation, the, st the stress acting on the mask is 8,800 pascals from the ball. Both results showed that the mask is capable of handling the test since the tensile strength was not reached. The next test is called high mass test, where a 500 bullet shaped metal is dropped from the same distance. Both simulation results and calculation results show that the mask passed the test. The last simulation was high velocity test, where a 1.06 gram steel ball is shot to the mask at a velocity of 91.44 meters per second. Simulation results showed that the maximum stress is on the steel ball, 
and the stress from the calculation says that the stress on, on the counterpoint is 0 0.32 megapascals, which is well below the tensile strength of the mask. For prototyping, we would like to take advantage of 3D printers we have on campus. We would like to buy this Ninja Flex 85A for elastic components in our design. It has a short harness of 85A and is easier to manipulate than other uh, 3D printing materials. For the mask cover, we would like to buy this Polymaker Polysmooth Filament clear version. With the help of isopropanol alcohol, the material will become transparent. You can see it in the picture on the left side. Uh, next, we come, next is the uh, cost analysis. In here, we show the manufacturing cost. We are assuming we are producing 100,000 units with injection molding. We will use polycarbonate, neoprene, and ABS material. As a result, the total cost of the manufacturing cost will be $15.7 per part. We've done this um, analysis from an online tool. Next is the manual assembly cost. This is the timetable. As a result, the total time cost will be uh, 159.14 seconds, assuming a $40 per hour manual assembly labor cost. The cost for assembly will be $1.77 per part. For material cost, in pound, the design will use an amount of 0.38 pound polycarbonate, 0. Uh, 48 pound of neoprene and one pound of ABS material. The cost for material will be $3.106 per part. With all the components to buy off the shelf, the grand total cost of our design will be $123.54 per part. So going to the future work, we would like to have some additional protective mechanism for the wiring in our current design. We want to create models for children's size paper we also want to improve aesthetics of our design. Fabricate the prototype. Control mechanism for airflow through the mask is also preferred. We also want to create energy saving features such as breathing activated fan to save energy and future usage. Thank you everyone for listening to our uh, presentation. Also thank you Anita Pankova and all the faculty members for your help during our research. If you have if you have any questions, please ask us now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great work and, and the excellent presentation. You covered uh, many details. Now, any questions from the audience? You can also post them on the chat or unmute your microphone and ask. So maybe a quick follow-up question. What do you think is the main challenge to make uh, these products uh, competitive compared to what uh, you have found in previous work in the literature? Um, I think it would be the modern system, both for the battery and filter, because uh, uh, as we've shown in the presentation, we're proposing an experiment for a uh, filter, a uh, monitoring system. So we didn't, we didn't know how that experiment was turns out and how the data, the result would turns out. So uh, I, I believe that the big companies like 3M out there, they already done um, many research on the, uh, on the mirror monitoring system for both battery and filter. So it would be, uh, it would be quite challenging if we uh, want to make our paper design competitive. So. And, and related to the cost, you had some cost estimates. How does it compare to the cost of a normal um, uh, commercial solution? Maybe you mentioned this already, but... Uh, uh, I will go to uh, slides. I uh, simply really quickly go through it. So in this slide, you can see the two simple commercially available to Pepper. We have the price of them. They e easily go over $1,000 per unit. So it's compared to our, yeah, compared to our design, it's much, much more expensive. It's almost an order of magnitude, right? That you have different. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Any further questions or comments?
Very good. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, another big round of applause for you. Thank you. Excellent work. And now let's move on to the last uh, group. So uh, Tianji and Francis are going to present about the droplets and aerosol dispersion modeling. So please, if you're ready, uh, share your screen. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Excellent. So we can see it. Please get started when you're ready. So good morning, everyone. Uh, we are Tianji Bai and Francis Del Campo. Uh, we'll be presenting our summer research work on droplet and aerosol dispersion modeling. The topics that we will be covering during this presentation are as follow. Next, please. Uh, we'll give a short introduction on what we have done during the summer, as well as the motivation and objectives that have driven us to do this work. Afterwards, we will uh, do a short overview of the previous work and a state of the art that is around the topics that we are covering during the presentation. We will also be discussing the methodology that we have used during the project. We will be also talking about the results that we have obtained for the different cases that we have uh, run and eventually we'll give uh, some conclusions as well as the future work that we want to keep on. Next, please. So basically, uh, the motivation behind the project was uh, to use fluid flow simulations to better inform uh, public health authorities in decision making, such as uh, how long a group can stay in a room, minimizing the risk of getting infected, how many uh, air conditioning cycles are needed to maintain a safe environment in a class or hospital room, and also um, questioning whether or not the six feet rule is adequate for social distancing. Uh, then uh, the goal of the numerical modeling efforts mainly, as I've mentioned, is a safe reopening of indoor spaces, reduce risks of infection in hospitals, and also help the health, authority, uh, health authorities for a safe reopening and come back to the life that we had previous to COVID-19. Next. So basically, the previous work on state of the art, uh, we have found that most of the simulations out there use low fidelity runs modeling and the turbulence model uh, uses the K epsilon mainly due to the reduced computational cost. And also there are, be, there are uh, outer ventilation patterns and initial exhale velocity dominate droplet dispersion indoors. So basically more or less it is known how the mm, droplets move around uh, a room. And also more or less uh, all these uh, re all the research is based on a person inside a big room where there is an HVAC uh, working and lighting. And basically that's how all the, all the research is mainly done. Next. And there are extensive experiments and numerical simulations for near field. Many of them show that the droplet, is, the drop, the droplet especially those small ones can reach six foot and we take some of them to validate our simulation approach. The software we use is Ansys Fluent, which is a mature and widely used commercial fluid simulation software and the virtual desk desktop helps us access the software and because some of our cases requires a high com computing performance. We need to install Fluent on the cluster and run simulation there. And we follow a progression of cases for validation of our simulation approach. And we will explain it in the results section. And we, we have do focus both the near field and the room scale. And we first begin with the low Reno low Reno members that is the steady state jet in 2D long channel. 
the figure on the right compares the streamline pattern, and our present numerical solution follows the same pattern as that as that from Battaglia, and the velocity profile at the different downstream distance also shown good agreement with the solution from Battaglia. The second series of simulation is about high Reynolds, high Reynolds member axisymmetric turbulence jet, including both steady state and transient state simulation. For the steady state simulation, the computational domain is five meters by five meters, and the inlet is at the lower left corner, and the bottom side is the axis of, of, of symmetry. We compare the K epsilon model and the Reynolds stress model in the simulation. Through the comparison of velocity, velocity decay along the center line and uh, self preservation velocity profile in the radical direction, in the radical direction, we conclude that the K epsilon model performs better for turbulent jet and for transient simulation. Oh, the computation, the computation domain is a little bit different. It's 10 meters by 2.5 meters. And our simulation, our solution, including velocity decay and velocity profile, also compares well with uh, experimental data from Hussein, which further invest, which further validates the case model. The third step is to add a passive scalar at and a surrogate of aerosols in a cough jet. It's a 3D domain, and the figure on the left shows the temperature, the temp temporal velocity profile at the inlet. And we can see, although the mesh is refined near the inlet, it's still coarse now. And we use K epsilon model in the simulation instead of. SST K omega model, which is used by by B at B's paper, and uh, in that temperature is 32 degree, and uh, compared with the ambient temperature around 21 degree. We compare the spatial average to velocity profile and found. And found qualitatively, and found the qualitative trend is similar, but their order of magnitude are different. And both coarse mesh and the different turbulence model may cause such a difference. And the passive scalar is used as surrogate of aerosol because it will be more expensive to run simulation, including aerosol in more fine mesh. The passive scalar is defined to follow the flow field passively, and the animation is from a simulation of constant velocity profile. It shows the scalar we defined does follow the flow field. Then uh, we move to near field, uh, high fidelity and steady simulations. Uh, for this simulation, we have uh, kept uh, the domain that has been previously used in the, in the other simulations, uh, second and third. And basically we have moved from the RANS model uh, to a one that has a higher fidelity called the LAS. And uh, basically, it's better to use unsteady solder of mass, momentum, and energy conservation loss. Also, um, basic, uh, we've uh, chosen a pulse injection velocity that lasts for uh, 0.6 seconds. And um, we've uh, developed two simulations, one that represents cough that more or less the peak velocity is around 20 meters per second and then low talking, or if we were to have a mask on and we were coughing around five meters per second. 
the inlet temperature, we are assuming body temperature at uh, 36 degrees Celsius. And the, the, the ambient temperature, the room temperature is around 20 degrees Celsius. Um, the water droplets that we have included in this simulation uh, is based as a discrete phase with a one-way flow coupling. And the diameter uh, of the particles of the droplets go from one to 100 uh, picometers distributed in 10 intervals. And as you can see on the figure uh, bottom right, um, the inlet velocity profile, uh, we've modeled it as uh, two linear trends that goes uh, from zero to 20 meters per second, and then uh, to zero again, and then to five, depending on what cases we have uh, run. One for the cough, as I've mentioned, and another one for the low talking and mass filter cough. Next, please. And this is the mess that we have uh, used to run the simulations. It has around 2.75 million cells, and it's very refined at the inlet as well as where the jet core is to be developed. And the problem is that we need to keep working with the simulations to confirm convergence criteria and be sure that the results that are obtaining are correct. And this is essential to know whether or not uh, the output of the project is going to be valid. Next. As you can see here on the, on the left, we have uh, the simulation for 20 meters per second peak injection velocity, and on the right for five meters per second, meaning that uh, wearing a mask is essential in order uh, to reduce the probability of infection. And also, as you can see on the 20 meters per second case, which is uh, if you were coughing, if you are within uh, two meters, more or less, that's around um, six feet. Six feet will be a little bit higher of two meters. Uh, the likelihood of getting infected is gonna be quite high, if, quite high if you are not wearing a mask. So that should be taken into consideration. And also, as you can see, it takes around uh, five seconds for the five meter per second uh, velocity to reach uh, around two meters. But if uh, we run the simulation for 20 meters per second, the amount of time that the droplets take from the injection point to two meters is way shorter. Next. And then we've also moved to room scale simulations. Basically what we've done is uh, following the paper from Chen and Zhao, we consider a room with an inlet uh, that represents the mouth of an infected person. The, room, uh, the boundary conditions are the room size three by four by five meters. And also the droplet modeling is represented as one injection of droplets at the inlet that lasts for 0 0.0 seconds. The material that we've used to represent the droplets as uh, in the other simulation is water liquid and HVAC cycles are uh, six and these parameters should have varied during the project and AC grid dimensions are 10 by 40 centimeters and the mesh quality is 6.7 million cells, 1.2 million nodes and the skewness is 0 0.35 and this is the, as you can see on the figure, this is the geometry that we've used for these room scale simulations. Next. Um, these room scale simulations were run under the runs and K epsilon model. As I've mentioned, the droplet modeling is represented as one injection and we wanted to vary this parameter from 0 0.6 to one second, depending on whether uh, you were coughing or sneezing to have a wide range of possible, a wide range of uh, options. Then uh, the velocity profile is uh, variable velocity profile of 1.25 seconds. And as I've mentioned, the paper uh, considers uh, six cycles per hour, but we actually want to know uh, how many H by cycles are needed to have uh, uh, to clean the air efficiently and maintain a safe environment. And with these simulations, what we have encountered is that they take a lot of time to run. The mesh must be very refined. And at this point, we are still working on them. And uh, we are not confident with the results that we have obtained. But the idea is 
to uh, modify the mesh and try to make everything work to obtain good simulations for these uh, room, full scale, room scale simulations. Next. And we now have the following conclusions. The K Omega mo K epsilon model has been validated to best replicate real life situation and uh, high fidelity LES simulation is needed for accurate prediction of, dis of droplet dispersion and for full-scale full simulations can be very, very expensive to run and cost mesh is, and the cost mesh is assist to account for droplets and predict dispersion of aerosol and droplets and mesh design is created it's critical to obtain good results and avoid avoid numerical issues. And for the future work, we will continue full scale simulations to assess safety of classroom environment, uh, assess efficacy of six foot rules when face masks are considered, including the effect of evaporation of the droplets and finally perform uncertainty quantification studies to significant parameters of influence like turbulent model. And that's, that's, that's for your it. attention. If anyone has any questions, we will ha be happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Tianyi and Francis, for your great work over the program and also for the nice presentation. Any questions for Tianyi and Francis? All right, so there is one question on the chat by uh, Professor Luhar. Can you give us some estimates of computational expense and time for the different simulations, RANS versus LES versus near, a near field versus room scale? that uh, you have tried so far and what types of simulations can be run without having to resort to the high performance computing facilities so on my side uh all the room scale uh, simulations must be developed or must be run on the hpc otherwise we run a uh, with issues with the energy equation as well as with the um, turbulence model that we are considering and due to the course mesh that we have to use, for example, if we were to use the VDI, the mesh must be very coarse rather than if we can use the HPC. And then for the cases that I try to run in a room scale uh, simulation on the HPC, it took about one hour and a half, two hours. But the issue is not, um, um running them it's actually what we need to write on the inputs to actually get the outputs that we are looking for so it involves m more than the expense time it's a it's very different if you use a visual interface and then if you work with the cluster so i also uh, noticed that please go ahead uh, mm. sorry Uh, well, for the simulation, I have done the first two steady state, this two steady state simulation, we, we can run it on the VDI. But instead, when, when it comes to the transient simulation, uh, we have to run it on the cluster. For this one, I shown showing this slide, it takes around five to six hours with 90, I think it's with 64 cars to run about five, mm -hmm. five to six hours. Thank you. And Professor Plutinsky had the question, I believe. Yeah, so I noticed that the essentially the two meter or six foot simulations look kind of scary in the sense that it, I might want to be farther away than, than six feet. Um, so do you think there, do you think that there are things in the model that are either overestimating or underestimating the dispersion? Or do you think, uh, if there are, can you, can you elaborate on those things? 
so from what we have uh, developed and run, we still need to validate uh, the results with other um, data and make sure that we are reaching a convergence criteria that we've mentioned on the presentation that the mesh still need to be worked on a little bit to make sure that we were getting that convergence criteria. So that's, I cannot say, or we cannot say that that's 100% correct because we haven't reached the, the criteria, but maybe uh, it's better to be farther away than six foot, that six feet. Because actually everyone mentions um, that rule, but where is it coming from? I don't think anyone knows where uh, the rule is coming from, or at least it hasn't been published. Maybe it's in the review of literature, but the health authorities never mention that. They always say you need to stay six feet away. Just to uh, maybe complement Francis' mm -hmm. answer, uh, there is some studies that go back to the 1930s on this uh, six foot rule. And there is subsequent studies that try to confirm it, but it is true that, uh, well, depending on the mode of uh, dispersion and infection, whether it's large droplets or aerosols or fine droplets, it's going to have an influence on how far they can reach, whether gravity is pulling them down to the ground, or if in the case of aerosols that were simulated in that uh, large eddy simulation case, if it's finer um, droplets, then those are going to reach much farther. And it is not unthinkable that they may reach, in this case, two meters or even farther. Now, in one case, it was done in one second. So the particles, the droplets were reaching and the target of two meters in about a second. In the other case, for the loud talking, it was taking about um, five seconds or more. But uh, So just to be clear, the, uh, the simulations are for, for aerosols or for large droplets? So that's a great question. What distinguishes aerosols and droplets? So there is a continuum distribution, right? So this included um, aerosols, somewhere in the range of one micrometer and five micrometer, as well as droplets to a certain range. So up to a hundred micrometers, but larger droplets that are typically going to fall much quicker, as you can see on this slide, uh, those were not included in the analysis. And I, was, I think also Francis, you mentioned the one-way coupling between yes. the multi-phase, the discrete phase and the continuum mm -hmm. phase. Uh, that may also have a potential effect on this dispersion. So ideally you want to have two-way coupling, but these simulations were including only one-way coupling. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any further comments or questions? If not, then uh, another big round of applause for Francis and Tianyi on your great work. And now I'm going to share my screen. We have just a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to see if there are any general questions um, or comments from the audience, from the participants. I wanted to pose one just in case um, we have time. We have told you about uh, a few of the challenges that are related to COVID-19, but we wanted to hear also from you what do you think are the most pressing engineering challenges nowadays? And um, just to conclude on this presentation, I wanted to thank the students for the great work during this summer program, especially under the circumstances. And then just to remind you to please upload the report by Friday and also to thank all the participants uh, that came to this event for your participation. And now if you want to add anything to the question that I posed or any other comments, please. Feel free to do so. You've already mentioned the requirements for the report, right, Professor? Uh, yes, I'll try to emphasize that in, in an email, follow up email. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just want to uh, shout out to all the professors and faculty members to providing us uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity during the summer. Um, it was a very uh, learning and uh, remark remarkable experience for me. And I think it's just going to be uh, help me in many ways. So I really appreciate 
uh, for, for providing this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. And it was great to have you and all the other students in the program. On my side, um, doing master's degree in aerospace engineering, I never expected to work on something related to health. So maybe that we, it's a, we've been, we are a mechanical and aerospace engineer, engineering students, but there are many more applications that we can think of. So that was very cool. I never expect, during undergrad, I never expected that going to grad school, I will be working in such a cool project like this one. So, and also thank you for the opportunity and all the help that we've received from professors, as well as feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. That's a nice comment. All right, so. So uh, finally, I would like to, you know, of course, thank to all the faculty participants and students and a big round of applause for Ivan. Without him, none, none of these would be possible basically, right? So he was our main catalyst in making sure that, that this happened. So again, it was a lot of effort on Ivan's part. I wanna make sure that we acknowledge that. Yeah. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for organizing us in this summit. Thank you, SK, and thank you all the faculty members who made this possible, and all the students. Without them, it'll be actually a useless uh, effort. So thank you for all your hard work, and um, thank you all for joining. Stay safe, stay well, and hope to see you all soon. I wish to thank you, all students and all faculty members, and thank you very much to all students for this excellent work. Thank you. Take care.